in listen only mode. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Eric Coleman with IIST and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, Software Quality Management, A Proactive Approach by Robin Goldsmith. We're excited you're able to join us today, set aside an hour to attend this webinar. This webinar is one of a series of free webinars to introduce the topics as well as the presenters of the upcoming PSQT conference in San Diego, California, August 14th through the 19th at the Sheraton San Diego Hotel and Marina. PSQT is the only conference that focuses on best practices in every aspect of software quality management. The ongoing theme of the conference, Practical, Proven, Feasible, keeps a focus on what works. To learn more about this exciting conference, visit psqtconference.com. You may submit your questions at any time by using your question box in your GoToWebinar window. Today's presenter will answer as many questions within the time allowed at the end of today's session. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing within 48 hours at psqtconference.com. At the end of today's webinar, you will be asked to complete a short survey. At IIST, we strive to provide the highest quality educational resources for the public and would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete this short survey. I will now turn the webinar over to today's presenter, Robin Goldsmith. Robin? Thank you, Eric. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. I, I suspect that uh, some of you have heard of me or heard me or even met me, and some of you perhaps don't know who I am, so I'll give you a, a nickel tour. I do work with and train professionals in a variety of areas, not just quality and testing but also requirements and measurement and ROI and software acquisition, project and process management. Once upon a time, I held honest jobs, used to be a developer, and then got into QA and uh, been in consulting, uh, including with a big four consulting firm for quite a while. have a bunch of degrees, including a couple of law degrees. I've been a member of a couple of uh, IEEE standard uh, working groups. Um, two of them are especially relevant. Uh, one is 829, the standard for software test documentation, and 730 on software quality assurance, and we'll be talking more about that standard today subject expert or was a subject expert for version 2 of the IIBA business analysis body of knowledge and also a subject expert in requirements and quality and testing for searchsoftwarequality.com which is a techtarget.com uh, website and, and company. I've written a book uh, called Discovering Real Business Requirements for Software Project Success and uh, forthcoming book, uh, on the same topic, uh, but with a focus on agile acceptance test-driven development and other projects. So, as Eric indicated, this webinar is a preview of a full-day seminar that I'll be presenting at PSQT in San Diego uh, on Tuesday, August 16th. And um, it deals with the, the CSQM body of knowledge area number one. For those of you who are, are not familiar with uh, IIST certifications, uh, be aware that each certification has seven body of knowledge areas. And uh, in order to earn a certification, you have to take one one-day class from each of those seven body of knowledge areas plus three electives. Uh, we're currently rolling out and have rolled out some uh, variations on that to, to pro uh, provide a progression, a series of levels of certification. Uh, and uh, you can learn more about that at, uh, from Eric or at IIST.org. So let's, uh, let's get into what I hope uh, should happen today. I want you to be able to make some distinctions between system and software quality and quality control, quality assurance, and quality management. I'm going to describe to you briefly, introduce to you what I call proactive software quality assurance, and uh, 
proactive software quality assurance has six functions that it deals with. And traditional software quality assurance, maybe not so many. We'll talk about some of those distinctions. And I want you to identify the five elements of proactive software quality management and their relation to the six functions of proactive software quality assurance. I hope those things are understandable and I hope they seem reasonable for why you're here. Now, I'm going to uh, uh, ask you, if you would, to share with me via the question box uh, or the Q&A box, I guess it just says questions, what you mean by system quality and software quality. Okay. And I'm going to uh, type what you're saying into the slide so everybody can see it. And as you're doing it, and then we'll ask a little bit more about why does it matter how you define system quality and software quality. And any issues with how your organization does or not define them. So if you would, please type into the question box what you mean by system quality, what you mean by software quality. And I'll try and capture those things, and I'll caution you. Those of you who have met me before know that uh, uh, my computer sometimes makes mistakes when I type things. So. Um, So, um, oops, computer's busy making mistakes right there. Okay, so um, let's see. We've got a couple of answers here already, and uh, let me see if I can. So, system is how well the overall system integrates. And these, these are flying in. Thank you for your contributions here. Okay. So how well the overall system integrates and performs. Let's see here. And integrates or performs. Um, everything including hardware and software. Hardware and software, whereas software quality is only software. Okay. okay. Um, try and capture that. Only software. Okay. Um, let's see, so thank you for these. Let's see if I can find. Okay. Integrates uh, okay. within a system and other third-party pieces. How well the overall system performs. System quality integration of multiple software applications. Okay, let's see. Rates, multiple applications. Okay. Software quality is conformance to requirements. System quality is how the system behaves under certain situations. So, how system behaves under certain situations, and software is conformance to requirements. Okay. okay. Let's see, we've got some good software quality, individual application quality. Okay, 
somebody says of the underlying code and um, individual individual application okay software quality how well it complies with or conforms to a design based on functional requirements okay say so. whoops System quality, how well it meets the business's needs. Uh, let's see. How well it meets business needs. And software quality. Okay, needs or goals. Okay, so we've got uh Got a lot of uh, a lot of answers there, and uh, you know there there's a lot of uh, overlap. Um, now, does anybody have any thoughts on what it matters, how you define these things? Anybody have any thoughts? You can. Uh, uh, Type that into the question box if you would. Okay. So any any thoughts on why it matters, how you define these things? Does it make a difference if you make a distinction? Differences in test strategy and resources. Okay, thank you, Lorraine. Definition implies what and how you manage and test. Clear, unambiguous, agreed to. Okay. Um, so if your organization, scope of work, okay. So if your organization um, makes distinctions between system quality and software quality, uh, does that put you in a different place from an organization that doesn't make such distinctions? Okay. So if we want to measure, determine quality, we need to know what we are evaluating. And yes, yes, it does make a difference. And how does it make a difference? How, where does that difference show up? Where does it manifest itself? So, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to suggest that uh, generally the big distinction that is made is that system quality includes hardware and software, whereas software quality is only the software. Now, that will make some difference on how you test things or what it is you're going to be testing if you have responsibility, say, only for the software part, and presumably that means somebody else has responsibility for the hardware. Now, let's consider, though, the significance of that. So at what point in the life cycle is it decided whether a solution includes hardware or just software? Well, that's really a design decision. Okay. And so if the system versus software distinction is one that you're making and is initially misidentified, what's the impact? It's going to impact 
your requirements. That misidentification is going to quite possibly mess up your requirements. Now, consider whether a design decision really should be determining and quite possibly messing up your requirements. In my humble opinion, design should follow requirements, not the other way around. Okay? And if the system versus software distinction subsequently changes, okay, such as during build and test, well, I would suggest that that further messes up or is likely to mess up both requirements and design. And I think we're all pretty well aware that uh, when requirements are messed up or when design is messed up, then the quality of the system is going to be impacted and not in a positive way. So let me encourage you to think about more carefully whether that system versus software distinction is relevant, especially with regard to quality, and whether it in fact is actually useful, or whether you've got the, heart, the cart uh, before the horse. So I'm going to also suggest that quality is key to delivering quicker and cheaper. And some of you may be familiar with the phrase, quality is free. So quality is free is actually the title of a book by Philip Crosby, who was one of the three big quality gurus. Now, Crosby really had a special meaning when he said quality is free, because what Crosby said is that quality is necessary that essentially the costs are the costs of poor quality. So if you're going to accomplish something, you have to do it at a suitable level of quality. And so that is a necessary expense. It's not really free, but the added costs are the costs of poor quality. Crosby said that there are three components of that. Assessment or appraisal, which is what QA and testing people tend to do. Prevention, which hopefully we're also involved in. And then the costs of failure, the costs of what happens when the poor quality is indeed implemented and manifested. And the failure cost are internal, so things that we see in terms of fixing, uh, redoing, uh, uh, combating bugs and, and defects and so forth. And then external costs, the costs to our customers, the costs to our company's reputation, the cost to business partners. Okay. And very often, the external costs completely outweigh the internal costs, but at least in my experience, folks in QA and testing almost entirely focus on the internal costs and often don't have real awareness or visibility into the external costs of poor quality. If you're going to be effective, if you're going to be managing software quality, you really need to be focusing on both and measure aware of them and measuring them and measuring them accurately and communicating them. So we're talking about definitions. And there are many, many definitions of quality. And I'm going to describe a couple of them and suggest that each one of them has some issues and that those issues indeed matter. And if you want to add anything, please do type it into the question box. So 
many people define quality as customer satisfaction. Well, customer satisfaction is not the same as quality. Presumably, quality will increase customer satisfaction. The fact is that there are customers who are satisfied with poor quality, and there are customers who are never satisfied with even the best quality. So customer satisfaction is relevant, but it is not quality. Similarly, many people say quality is meeting or exceeding customer expectations. Same game, same game. If a customer expects crummy quality and you meet that, it's still crummy quality. And customers can expect quality that is unrealistic and unreasonable, which you cannot feasibly meet or exceed, okay? and you could still have very high quality. So meeting or exceeding customers' expectations is sort of related to customer satisfaction, but the criteria that are used are not the same as quality. Hopefully there is some relationship, but it is by no means you know, a, a complete one-to-one. -one. Some people say quality is optimization. Some people say quality is value, whatever is of value to somebody. Well, optimization is not the same as quality. Optimization is more of an efficiency issue, not so much a quality issue. And value, once again, some people, you know, certainly we would hope that in, in general that higher quality will be valued more. But we know that people value poor quality higher than sometimes we would expect or hope and that sometimes they don't value higher quality as much as we would want. Philip Crosby, one of the three gurus of total quality management, said that quality is conformance to requirements. This is probably the most widely used definition of quality in the quality and testing community. Once again, what's the issue with it? The issue is with the requirements. Conformance to poor requirements is not necessarily quality. So if the requirements are not right, conforming to them is not producing quality may or may not produce customer satisfaction and so forth. W. Edwards Deming, another one of the gurus, tend to speak in terms of statistical information and you know more or less lack of defects. Um, could you have something that did not have defects that still was not considered high quality? So there are aspects of quality besides defects. Certainly defects will reduce the impression or, or uh, perception of quality, but simply lacking defects may not be sufficient. And some of you are familiar with Six Sigma. Six Sigma is another statistical formula, and it talks about minimal variation within specification. So variation is important, and minimal variation is very often an aspect of quality. But if that specification is not right, Minimal variation within a wrong specification is still not quality. And uh, 
Joseph Duran, the third of the big three uh, quality gurus of the total quality management uh, movement, uh, said quality is fitness for use. Now, in many ways, this is perhaps the, uh, uh, the most satisfying of the definitions. And yet, there's still the question of the definition of use and the definition of fitness. So fitness for an inappropriate use or not having appropriate use defined kind of interferes with this. And then there's the question of what does fitness mean? And that, that's yet a, another area. And Alan has said quality is meeting the customer's needs and solving their problems. And uh, I, would, I would agree that that's related to it. And, uh, but uh, I'll suggest, and we'll look into this a little bit further, that there are a couple of additional aspects to it. So I think that any of the proponents of any of these uh, seven definitions might feel that, that their definition means meeting customers' needs and solving their problems, even though none of these definitions actually says that. So what's it matter if your definition of quality is if you have one of these, then you're probably subject to other issues that maybe you're not aware of and that can impact your ability to b deliver and manage quality. So if we don't get a common definition of quality, then what's going to happen is that each person thinks that the other guy doesn't care about quality. And everybody's going to keep pointing fingers and disappointing each other and that's really exactly opposite of what we're trying to accomplish when we manage quality. So let me add a couple of concepts to help us. So there are uh, these things called quality dimensions. There are three quality dimensions. And I will tell you, I did not invent these terms. These terms have been around in the quality control movement for at least 100 years and maybe longer. So the first quality dimension is quality of design. What's it need to do? The required functions and so forth. The quality of design says that it, the design suitably meets the requirements and that costs and benefits and schedules are accurate. Okay. And that if we have trade-offs, that they're based on adequate information. So that's quality, the first quality dimension, quality of design. The second quality dimension is quality of conformance. This is what QA and testing tends to focus on. You know, is are the products conforming to design, applying appropriate techniques and standards and skill and using appropriate methods and tools and practices? And ultimately, quality of conformance means that it's delivered on time and in budget. Because if it's not on time, then there's less value. If it's not in budget, people might have chosen something else. And then the third quality dimension is quality of performance, how it's delivered, you know, that it's available as needed, as needed, that it works in the intended manner, reliably, accurately, handles workloads, is supported and maintained responsively. So I would suggest that all three of these quality dimensions are part of quality. And yet, I think if you look back on how things are done in your world, that you probably tend to focus on one or maybe two, but probably not all three. And I would I would suggest, at least in my experience, that in most organizations, the quality of performance tends to be the part that's most often overlooked, that we draw this line at implementation 
we kind of lose sight of what happens after that. Well, the what happens after that is the life of the product system or software. People also pay attention to what are called quality factors, and some refer to these as non-functional requirements. I will encourage you not to use that term because these really only have relevance with regard to functionality. So some of these are externally visible quality factors. And very often, by the way, these are referred to as illities because many of them end in illity, like usability and reliability and adaptability and so forth. And there are also a bunch of internal quality factors. And those tend to be more of concern to the people on the engineering or construction end. And some people mistakenly refer to these, and I'll just call them illities, even though some of them don't really end in illity. But when you call them illities, it, it actually makes it clearer than if you refer to them as quality factors or what some people refer to them as quality requirements. Perhaps some of you are, are familiar with that. And hopefully you can see why if you refer to these as quality requirements, you lose sight of the fact that the most important aspects of quality are the application or business aspects, the deliverables, the capabilities. Okay. The bulk of quality is that it does something useful. These are all modifiers of that usefulness. Okay. And as we said, some of them are exterior, some of them are interior, and some of them pertain to futures. The futures are often overlooked, and that's where we often encounter difficulties because problems occur as we continue to use things into the future. So if we put these concepts together, I think we've got two, two components there that we need to pay attention to, how much and how well. So the quality factors relate to the how well. And they are essentially captured within engineering standards. And the how much relates to the business requirements or the capabilities. And some of those come about, and we, we pay attention to them, in the analysis and design process. That's where we're primarily concerned with quality of design. Quality of conformance we tend to pay attention to in the development activities. That's the, that's the testing, primarily the testing that we're familiar with. And then quality of performance comes to the surface during the operation of that delivered product. And of course the, the operation is by far, or usually by far, the longest period in the life of that product system or software. But it's the one that tends not to have the visibility early. So when we put these things together, I'm going to suggest a working definition of system quality. And I hope you will find this helpful. I, I think that it overcomes the weaknesses of those seven common definitions. So we're saying that system quality is the extent to which the system meets weighted, stated and implied exterior, interior, and future real business requirements. And those of you who are familiar with some of my work know that that's a specialized meaning. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But the real business requirement of all affected stakeholders, internal and external, consistent with standards of design, workmanship, and performance. 
And I think that this goes beyond simply conformance to requirements or satisfaction or fitness for use. So the concept of real business requirement is that they are the right requirements, that they are accurate and reasonably complete, sufficiently complete. They're dealing with the things that are needed in order to provide value. And so I emphasize the word real by capitalizing it. Okay, and the reason it's not an acronym, but what I found is that if I tried to use any other emphasis technique, that one or other technology tends to disappear. It underlining, boldface, italics, they all get wiped out in one place or another. All capitals tends not to be modified. So it's not an acronym. Some people say, well, that's the difference between wants and needs. Well, not exactly, because very often what you think a want is a want turns out to be a need. And so that's not a real reliable distinction. The way that I differentiate it is that the real business requirements, and these are business deliverable what's as opposed to product requirements, which are forms of how, ways to satisfy the real business requirements, that the real business requirements are the ones that we end up with. So in the course of development, it's very common that people define what they think the requirements are, and then they keep finding changes and ultimately they back into, in many instances, what they really could have and should have defined in the first place. So real business requirements are what you end up with. And they're not designed, they're what the design satisfies, and, but the real business requirements are what provide value when the implemented design satisfies them. So hopefully that's an understandable definition. So the more of the relevant real business requirements which are met, and the more demanding the standards are with respect to meeting those requirements, the higher quality. So the more of the relevant requirements, the higher the quality. The more demanding the standards with respect to each of those requirements, the higher the quality. So quality is absolute. It's an engineering concept. What varies is how much quality you get. And that's going to be governed by your resources, your priorities, and other constraints. But the quality itself doesn't change based upon your ability to achieve it. A Rolls-Royce is a high-quality car, whether or not you can afford to buy one. And value is the perceived benefit of the quality received relative to the costs of producing and receiving it. So value is a perceived benefit, and it's relative to the cost of producing and receiving that quality. So hopefully these definitions are understandable. Hopefully you can find the value in them. I think that they are more relevant, more workable, more useful than some of the common conventional thinking. And I use as a shorthand version that system quality means meets real business requirements consistent with standards. But that's the shorthand version. Because the longer version is a little bit harder to deal with. So hopefully you'll find that useful and uh, can apply that in your own world. So we have other terms here. So we have quality controls. 
system quality control, software quality control, and the big distinction is, once again, whether it's hardware and software or just software, and for most purposes, that's not going to matter. So if you would type in the question box, your distinction between quality control, quality assurance, and quality management. I'm not going to type your answers, uh, but uh, you know if you can uh, if you can share with us, I'll try and read those to people. And uh, as you're as you're doing that, once again, the question of what difference it makes. So okay. question about defining quality is that it is highly influenced by user, customer, and perception. Okay, And I agree with you that it is, except that I think that what's, what varies is not whether or not it's quality, but the value that is placed upon that quality. I think that the, we can define quality from an engineering standpoint. Okay. And, uh, you know, you're certainly welcome to, to have a different opinion. Okay. So let's see if I can um, find some of these answers here. So quality assurance, testing the product to ensure maintenance of quality, quality control, methods and processes to ensure that production stays within established limits. Uh, Alan says quality control is ensuring standards are being followed. Quality assurance is that standards are useful and increasing quality. Uh, Christina says quality management is managing and creating a framework for quality product delivery. Quality control is measuring or testing the product against requirements to determine defects quality management, process to balance systems to maintain and measure quality, quality control, ways to monitor the success of quality assurance. Okay, so we had a, we had a variety of answers there. Um, let me indicate what generally is meant by quality control. That is that testing is the most common form of quality control. And I know that many of you come from organizations where the folks who do the testing are called quality assurance. And uh, let's see, uh, Mark says quality management, is developing, administering, and monitoring the policies, procedures, and practices used for QA and QC. Okay, that's a, a good example as well. So the big distinction is between quality control and quality assurance, and common terminology very seldom makes that distinction or makes it accurately or consistently. So. Indeed, testing is quality control. And quality assurance is not the same thing. Okay. Now, if organizations mix and match their use of these terms and don't distinguish, then there's a real good chance that they get into hodgepodges, both within their thinking and within their actions. And essentially what happens is that if indeed do represent different things, that there's a good chance that the organization is unlikely to get all of those things because their definitions are not uh, making the, the suitable distinctions. Okay. If organizations do have separate groups for, say, QC and QA, 
some organizations do have a testing group and a, a quality assurance group or a quality management group typically based upon some kind of a distinction um, you know that's meaningful to that to that group or to that organization well guess what happens it's very common that having multiple groups in kind of the same pond can lead to bureaucracy and turf wars and duplication and things falling through the cracks. In part because each group assumes that some other group takes care of something. So even if you're on target there, you, you still have the issues of things falling through the cracks and assumptions and duplication. I'm sure many of you can identify with this. So. I mentioned uh, that I was a member of uh, I, the working group that came up with uh, a new uh, IEEE standard 730 for software quality assurance. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, to some extent that the revised standard, which greatly expanded the prior version, has been around since the 70s. Um, incorporates and is guided by some key concepts from my proactive software quality assurance methodology. So we were guided in updating, revising the, the software quality assurance standard by IEEE standard 12207, which is the kind of the overarching standard for software lifecycle processes. And so I just want to give you a quick summary of some relevant sections there. So in, in section six, which deals with, or six point two, which deals with organizational project enabling processes, that's where they talk about the quality management process. Okay, and they say that the, uh, the standards 12207 says the purpose of quality management process is to assure that products, services, and implementations of life cycle processes meet organizational quality objectives and achieve customer satisfaction. Okay. And then section seven, which deals with specific or software specific processes, has a section on software qualification testing, which means testing. And that's to confirm that the integrated software product meets its defined requirements. That's, uh, that's a common definition of testing. And then 7.2 in support processes, it describes software quality assurance as providing assurance that work products and processes comply with predefined provisions and plans. Okay. So that's the that's the way that IEEE standard 12207 distinguishes these and I readily recognize that those distinctions may not be the same as ones that you make and may or may not be terribly helpful. Okay. But the, a critical part of it is the quality assurance as conventionally defined means that work products and processes comply with predefined provisions and plans. Quality assurance is really a as, as defined conventionally envisions quality assurance as a compliance act. And so when we put these together, a lot of people recognize that quality control or testing is concerned with products, examining products, typically end products, and confirming that the products 
conform to specifications, and people, people often refer to those as requirements. That's most commonly done by testing, dynamic testing, executing the code. Quality assurance is assuring that the processes producing the products in fact produce products of necessary or suitable quality. To many people, that means examining intermediate products, primarily reviews of requirements and or designs, and or checking compliance of documents to various format standards and guidelines, where QA tends to act in the hated traffic cop role. I hope you can see that these common interpretations are in fact quality control. They're not looking at processes, they're looking at products, albeit intermediate products. And so what people often call quality assurance is actually quality control even when it's not dynamic code testing. So when we look at this in a little bit different way, we see that quality, first and foremost, results from how well quality is defined. Secondly, how well it's been implemented. And thirdly, how well testing detects defects which do exist. In this three-pronged approach, the impact is overwhelmingly the highest with regard to how well the quality is defined, less than how well it's implemented, and least on how well testers detect defects. When we look at effort, it's just the opposite, that most development organizations devote the greatest amount of their effort to testing and the least amount of their effort to defining quality well, which is where the biggest impact is. So when we get proactive, we need to realize that quality assurance is really first and foremost concerned with the processes. We want to make sure that we're defining a appropriate methods and techniques and assuring that projects use them well, that we want to have an environment that promotes quality, that we also need to make sure that the projects are applying those methods and techniques, the appropriate methods and techniques appropriately to produce appropriate products and that that ties to, first of all, how well the system quality is defined, secondly, how well it's implemented, and thirdly, testing to catch defects, okay. which is primarily a product and end product orientation, which is a necessary part of this, but it is not the main thing. Testing is the tail of the dog. But in most organizations, that's where the bulk of the effort goes, and the processes don't produce suitable quality. Value is by far greatest as we go process, then project, then product. And so when we put all these things together, proactive software quality assurance is establishing an environment that produces quality. From conception through retirement, defining when, what, and how to test, addressing design, workmanship, and management practices, ways to improve, ways to prevent. Okay? And the heart of that are quality controls, because those are going to be the indicators um, uh, that, that help us tell how well these things are being done. Okay? And let's see, we've got a question from, from Jim. Effort meaning most effort required or most typically applied? 
And when we're talking about effort on those on that prior uh, uh, triangle slide, we're talking about where organizations ordinarily expend the effort, not where they ought to be. They should be expending it in proportion to impact, but in fact, generally the effort is expended based upon some other criterion, primarily testing. Which isn't saying testing is bad, only that testing isn't going to overcome all the process and project issues. So when we look at six functions of proactive software quality assurance, and when we do the full day seminar, we have a chance to get into these in considerably greater detail. But first of all, defining quality assurance plans, what to do. That was the sole topic of the original IEEE standard 730. Now it's been expanded to include much more. So proactive software quality assurance is defining the methods and practices and standards, how to do it well. Okay. Assuring that systematic quality controls of both processes and products are done to make sure things get done right. Maintaining quality records to keep track of what's going on. You want to keep track of it so you can analyze and report, so you can learn from it. And there is also the cheerleading, the encouragement, the directing attention to improve quality. A critical aspect is that these are functions of the quality assurance, the proactive software quality assurance process. It doesn't mean that an individual with SQA in their title has to be the one who does it. It means that the process needs to make sure that these things are done and done well. And managing software quality starts with identifying how to create quality, assuring that the methods and processes for creating quality have been used and used effectively, assuring that suitable software with suitable quality has been created and is supported suitably, improving the methods and processes for creating and evaluating software quality, and balancing the costs and time of sufficient quality, and Crosby would call that free quality, against the costs of poor quality. So I would suggest that those five elements are what we really need to mean by managing software quality. And that I would contend that for all intents and purposes, proactive software quality management and proactive software quality assurance are the same thing. But what happens is that some organizations make particular parts of organizations responsible for particular parts of this. And so embedded within both proactive software quality management and proactive software quality assurance is that if there is some organizational unit that's responsible for an area, that's good. And if there's not, it says that this software quality management or software quality assurance function needs to make sure that it gets done regardless. And that this is true for both hardware and software. Okay. And that it goes in both directions. So I don't see a value in making a distinction between software quality management and software quality assurance. But if your organization does, good for them. But you need to make sure that whatever is done and carved out by one doesn't cause necessary things to fall through the crack. So hopefully you've seen some distinctions between system and software quality. The distinction is primarily System quality typically means hardware and software are included, whereas software quality just deals with software. Big distinction between quality control and quality assurance is that quality control deals with products. 
and quality assurance should deal with processes. We saw the six functions that proactive software quality assurance deals with, what to do, how to do it well, making sure it gets done right, keeping track of it, learning from it, and encouraging it. And we saw the five elements of software quality management, identifying how to create quality, assuring that the methods and processes have been used effectively, assuring that the suitable software with suitable quality has been created and is supported suitably, improving both the methods and processes for both the creating and evaluating software quality, and making meaningful balancing of the costs and time between what's necessary for sufficient or free quality and poor quality. So hopefully these things are understandable. Uh, I remind you that uh, we've got a full day version of this where we get to go into each of those areas on the proactive software quality assurance and managing the five for managing software quality. I hope you would find uh, uh, more understandability. Hopefully these, this overview has been understandable. And uh, if you have additional questions, uh, please do type them into the questionnaire. I'll stick around uh, for a while. And uh, you know, I will remind you that uh, uh, in addition to the PSQT conference, uh, I and other instructors uh, present uh, numerous uh, courses uh, through IIST, both in public training weeks, and we can come in-house and work with you. And we have a number of these recorded so that you can uh, listen to them at your time and convenience. And we can all come and work directly with you and uh, uh, work, help you apply these concepts and, and others in the, with regard to the particulars of your own situation. So there's a question about will the slides from the webinar be available after the webinar? And Eric, I believe uh, you can answer that. Uh, yes, Robin. Uh, no, they will not be made available, but uh, again, this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be made available at uh, psqtconference.com. So, thank you on that. Uh, other questions? Uh, hopefully you found this understandable and helpful. And uh, maybe gave you some opportunity to think about some of the things that you do or don't do or take for granted, perhaps, and uh, get some perspectives that may be helpful to you. That's our objective. Any, any other questions or comments? Uh, anything else that uh, anybody would like to add? We'll, we'll stick around for another minute or two and answer any questions. OK. OK. Thanks, informationally dense presentation. Uh, I hope dense is used in a good way there. Good use of 60 minutes. Okay. Well, so we'll have to sell this to CBS. Okay. Add this to their 60 minutes program, right? So uh, good. Any any other questions or comments? Okay. Anything that's not clear? Anything anybody'd like me to further confuse? So I I hope that you will all avail yourself of additional opportunities. There are a number of these free webinars, uh, previewing uh, seminars at PSQT. I hope that we'll see you all in San Diego. It's a really beautiful place to be. And uh, uh, if you haven't been there, it's an interesting city to visit. And uh, you know the facilities at the uh, conference are lovely. And there's an awful lot of good presentations and good content and good opportunity to share ideas with other people in the industry. So uh, I'll give you know a few seconds more, and then if uh, if we don't get any other questions here, I'll, I'll bid you all adieu and say thank you very much for attending. And uh, let me know if you have any other questions. You can reach me at Robin underscore Goldsmith at iist.org.
Thank you, Robin. I don't. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I don't see any other any other questions, so I'd like to thank you for your time today, Robin, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's free webinar sponsored by IIST, the leaders in education-based certifications and training. For more information on how IIST can help you or your organization, please visit IIST.org. Be sure to join us for the next webinar in this series, Feature-Based Project Management, new, new Discipline for Project and QA Managers by Dr. Meg DeHanna on May 20th from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. To learn more about this and other webinars in this series, go to psqtconference.com. You can follow IIST on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube to find out more information about IIST news, events, and promotions. Thank you all again for joining us, and have a great day. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Eric. Bye, everybody.